Chapter 2. An Introvert's Nightmare. Summary for this chapter. Inko's job interview leaves her feeling shaken. When had quirks become so scary? Cell phone connection was spotty all over Regalo, and Inko found herself favoring emails to communicate with friends and those she left behind in Japan. Wi-Fi and the internet, at least, were easy to access once she located which businesses had hotspots, and once she set up a password for her own Wi-Fi router at home. It was almost refreshing to see the, a close rapport between the locals on the island, with easy chatter, small talk, and a slow lifestyle replacing the loud and crowded, but lonely, suburban city life she had come from. It was also stressful and downright terrifying. People expected her to actually talk to them. Inko had downloaded an entire Italian to Japanese dictionary onto her phone, but she still found times when the words she tapped into the little text box didn't make sense, and other times when the translation app gave her nothing to go off at all for Regalo's Italian dialect. In the moments when she grew flustered during a conversation, feeling pressured to understand and reply, she used her quirk to grab something she dropped, which was always followed by a curt warning. She didn't understand every word, but she understood the tone well enough. She would have been content enough with a smile and simple greeting. She could handle greetings fine, but she needed more time before she stopped freezing at a barrage of Italian directed her way. Entering Izuku into the nearby school hadn't been too much trouble, thanks to the very little in-person setup. The first steps had been done online with some heavy use of Google Translate before they even left Japan. Then, just a week after removing to Regalo, she was walking Izuku to school, sending him inside with an Italian phrasebook he barely knew how to read, along with flashcards with some simple Italian phrases on one side, and their meanings in Japanese on the other. Even if he didn't have too much of a grasp of the Roman alphabet, he could at least show the cards to the teacher if he needed anything. Inko fretted that entire day over whether he was okay on his first day at school. When she picked him up a few hours later, he just looked so exhausted that she wanted to scoop her small child up in her quirk and drown him in apologies, never letting go of him again. The teacher spoke slowly, enunciating clearly enough for Inko to get the message that while Izuku had caught on amazingly quick to everything around him and the subjects taught that morning, he had cried most of the day. Moving was an adjustment for the both of them. They would get through it. In the meantime, they could get some ice cream to make the days a little easier. It took another few weeks before Inko managed to get a job. She wasn't exactly sure how, but thankfully she had been able to translate her certifications from Japan into Italian through a relatively cheap but reputable service. Her own proficiency in Italian hadn't been much help in translating her resume, so she had to assume her certifications carried her past the application phase. Heart fluttering with anxiety and head swimming with nervous thoughts, she dropped Izuku off at school before heading off to the clinic. That was the day she met Jolie. Her nerves wouldn't, couldn't allow her to get distracted, anxiety through the roof as she paced her way to the receptionist, heedless of the people chattering around her. She barely got out some badly pronounced scripted Italian to the woman at the front desk before someone else spoke up. So you're the new nurse from Japan? Inko nearly screamed at the sudden voice, but instead her heart just jumped out of her chest for a few terrifying moments, and she nearly dropped the folder containing her resume. Thankfully it stayed in her hands. A success on both accounts. She looked up at the man, processing that he had spoken in fluid Japanese. He was a dark-haired man who was dressed in a black suit the jacket unbuttoned and white tie askew across a blue shirt. However, the feature that stood out the most to her was his sunglasses. It was strange that anybody would wear sunglasses indoors, much less with lenses so dark they made it impossible to see his eyes. Her tongue untied when she remembered that he asked her a question. Nursing assistant, she corrected. And, well, I'm actually here for the job interview. I'm Midoriya Inko. Uh, mi chiamo Inko Midoriya. Nursing assistant. Got it, the man mused. Jolie Shinsho. Given name Jolie, surname Shinso. Inko sighed in relief, realizing that was one person she wouldn't have to be confused about with name order. May I call you Signora Shinso? Just call me Jolie, Signora, he requested. 
You'll actually be doing more interpretation and translation for the doctors instead of any medical duties, but I preferred someone with medical experience for this job. Inko jolted, realizing who she was facing. The man didn't dress like a doctor, but she assumed the suit was for the interview. Are you... I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't realize. I'll be interviewing you today, Senora Midoriya. He cut her off, answering her question. He gestured to the door past the waiting room. If you would follow me, and we'll get started. Of, of course. Regardless of how brusque and intimidating Jolie came off as, she followed him, the folder clutched to her chest and her purse over her shoulder. She needed the job, even if she thought her Italian was sorely lacking for the abrupt change in job description. You know, Jolie began conversationally making her jump, but he didn't glance back at her. Ogalo gets a lot of Japanese tourists. It's that familiar sort of island, and we have enough resources in Japanese so that knowing Italian isn't really required to get around. Inko nodded. I've seen those. Brochures and books in the Japanese covered popular tourist sites, local restaurants, festivals, and common culture, but Inko hadn't found that information very important when it came to establishing a life on the island after she marked her calendar and copied the useful Italian phrases on flashcards to study. The resident she had moved into wasn't that close to the tourist areas. With more people from Japan visiting and marrying into families here, that means we needed an interpreter in the medical field for those who come to the clinic. But Signor Jolie, I'm not trained as an interpreter, she protested. I'm not even fluent in Italian. Do you want the job or not? Jolie stopped and turned to look at her. Inka froze. This was it. She was going to be turned away, and then she would have to start the job hunt all over again. Jolie sighed, running a hand through his hair before he pushed open a door and gestured inside. We'll conduct the interview here. He waited for her to go inside, nodding to the table with chairs around it in the middle of the break room. There was something off about the interview room, she noted, which for all intents and purposes looked like a standard staff break room. It made her wonder if this was even the right interview she'd come to the clinic for at all. She placed the folder on the table as she took a seat, and Jolie scooped it up immediately, flipping it open. Inko waited with bated breath as he sat down across the table from her, rocking the chair back on two legs. Signora Midoria, he began, placing the folder on the table and taking off his sunglasses. How would you rate your proficiency in Japanese medical terminology? Uh, the sudden interview question caught her off guard. Very well. I've been working in the medical profession for several years now. Jolie spread her cover letter and resume on the table in front of him, but he didn't read any of it. He stared directly at her, his sunglasses hanging from his fingers, and it pained her heart to realize why he wore them. Inko barely held herself together, wondering what kind of life it was to hide one's quirk like that. A circular symbol covered his right eyeball, his people obscured behind it, but she knew both eyes were focused on her. Jolie's expression was piercing. Judging. She had seen individuals with mutant-type quirks cover up their harsher features, had read novels and watched movies about people discriminated against for their features or learning to accept them, and had seen the advertisements for cosmetics and clothes that claimed to cover up the smaller, unusual features. At that moment, she remembered where she was and why she had moved here. Inko had taken Izuku to Regalo to escape the toxic culture surrounding quirks in Japanese society. If she had to hide her minor form of telekinesis here, a quirk that disturbed nobody's sensibilities, she couldn't imagine the life of someone with even a small, visible marker of their quirk on their body, forced to hide that part of themselves for all their life. Do you enjoy working on the medical field? Jolie's question jolted Inko, and she flushed, realizing she had been staring in silence. I'm so sorry, I... Uh, yes, I find it very rewarding, she rushed to answer, tearing her eyes away, and she forced her mind back to the topic. I enjoy helping people, and my... She stumbled over her words having been about to mention that her cork was well suited for moving small objects without putting germs and bacteria from her hands on them, but she had to remember that even if this man had a quirk as well, casual chatter about it, even in Japanese, was discouraged in Regalo. Jolie interrupted her before she could recover. What's your favorite part of working as a nursing assistant? Meeting people, Inko replied, trying to keep up with the shift in questioning. In addition to keeping her gaze from falling to the table between them, Jolie's gaze never straying from her face. To be honest, I loved working in pediatrics. It was always a rest of joy to be helping kids, especially when I could see them leave with a good outlook. Oh, and the parents were always so grateful. 
I have a kid myself now, and I have to say, the joy is still there. She found herself smiling, even in the face of Jolie's unwavering stare. I'm working on my Italian and trying to get this job for him. I want him to have a good future, so I have to work hard to give him that. Signora Midoria, do you know why I'm interviewing you? He blinked and rubbed his right eye before putting his glass sunglasses back on. Huh? I'm sorry, I'm not too familiar with how things work here. She apologized, wondering what she had missed. It's because you're taking my position here at the clinic, he answered for her, gathering her resume papers. I have Japanese heritage, as you might have noticed, and I lived in Japan for a while, but I'm not a native like you are. I'm taking your place? Inka frowned, and she leaned forward, suddenly worried. I'm not stealing your position from you, am I? Jolie chuckled. No, I just wanted more time to work on my research. I had to make sure my replacement was suitable before I left. He slid her folder back across the table. So I might... She hardly dared to assume. Before he gave her an answer, he pulled a card out from his jacket pocket, holding it out for her to see. A license of some sort, the word quirk among the rest of the text drawing her notice. She figured out it was a quirk license unique to her gallo before he tucked it away again. Once the card was pocketed, he stood up, readjusting his sunglasses. I've been using my quirk on you to evaluate you fully, and while I find you suitable enough and you start work tomorrow... Inko's breath caught in her throat, her mind whirling at the idea of an unknown quirk being used on her, but she steeled and refocused herself. At the end of the day, there was only one thing that mattered. She had the job. It will be your job performance here that ultimately proves whether you're the right fit. Most of your work will be in nursing but you will be the sole Japanese-Italian interpreter on site. Inko breathed, hardly able to believe it. So I'm hired? That's what I said, Jolie said as he walked to the door without a glance in her direction. La Cana Familia keeps a careful eye on this clinic, so don't worry about the details. Come in tomorrow, eight o'clock sharp. Everything will be sorted by then. Grazie. Grazie molto, Jolie. He didn't respond, walking out without even a farewell or good luck, leaving her alone in the break room. Inko slid back down into the chair, heart thumping against her chest. She belatedly realized she was shaking, the folder having somehow made its way into her arms as she clutched to her chest. Jolie hadn't shown her his quirk eye to test her reaction. He had done it to use his quirk. A quirk he hadn't asked her permission to use on her first, and one he hadn't explained. It had to be a mental quirk. She glanced at the clock and checked herself over, but couldn't find any odd after effects. She took a few deep breaths to calm herself. Once she was sure she could walk without her legs shaking, she got up and left the break room. The woman at the front desk gave her a sympathetic smile. Come esta? She asked a note of concern in her voice. Bene. Inko smiled. A mix of emotions between elation at scoring the job and wondering if she should feel violated. Abbastanza bene. Good enough. That answer fit how she felt right about then. The woman at the desk nodded, and Inko shot her a smile, trying to convince both her and herself that the interview had gone fine. A month after moving to Regalo, Inko sent her first snail mail. It was a postcard she had planned on adding stickers to, and Izuku caught her looking at the cards in the shop. I'm going to send a postcard to your auntie Mitsuki, she told him, showing him some choices of postcards with scenic photographs, so she can see how pretty the island is. Can I send Katya on a card? Izuku asked, circling around the postcard stand to look at all the cards. Inko smiled. That's a great idea. Do you want to pick out a card? You can write a message on it when we get home, and we'll st pick some stickers to put on it too. Izuku cheered. At home, Izuku dictated everything at lightning speed to Inko who wrote a slightly edited version of Shizuku's message on his postcard to Katsuki. His verbal vocabulary far outweighed what he knew how to write, but he had a lot of ideas and stories in his heart to share with his best friend. Her tiny handwriting allowed her to squeeze all his thoughts on the small space, and she let him sign it himself at the end. If she omitted his mentions of being quirkless, well, that would be her little secret. It turned into something of a tradition for them, sending physical mail to the Bakugo family, and soon Mitsuki's letters were delivered alongside letters written by Katsuki himself. Reading over the postcard addressed to her son first, Inko was satisfied to see a lack of mean-spirited comments and few references to quirks, so she handed it to Izuku. 
His excitement translated into physically bouncing up and down, making her laugh. He read it with a big smile on his face, even though he kept asking for her to explain kanji and sound out the hiragana with him every few seconds. She made a mental note to check the local library for any Japanese kids' books. The school would teach him Italian and everything else, but it was up to Hinko to make sure he never lost his native language. Even from halfway across the world, Kotsky's and Izuka's friendship continued. End of chapter 2